Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A portion of God's word for our consideration today as we celebrate our, our final midweek Lenten service is from the book of Daniel, the sixth chapter. We'll reference it as we go along today. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts may they be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Daniel had to be counting his blessings. He'd been taken captive as a teenager into the nation of Babylon, and the Lord had blessed him to survive two kings already in their visions and dreams. And now the third king, Darius the Mede, who had really no connection to Daniel, no loyalty to him, had promoted Daniel to be one of three supervisors over the entire kingdom. And the Lord had continued to bless Daniel and his work in Babylon so much so that Daniel had distanced himself from the other supervisors, and it was the intention of Darius to make Daniel in charge of the entire kingdom. Well, obviously, this prompted jealousy. These other supervisors tried and tried to find dirt on Daniel, but they couldn't. They had to do something, though, and so they thought the only thing that they could do would be to attack Daniel where he was different from everyone else. They had to go after Daniel's relationship with his God. And so they hatched a plan. These supervisors went to Darius and they buttered him up. And they told him that it would be good to issue a decree that no one prayed to anyone else or any other god for 30 days except for the king himself. Now this idea of kings being gods was very prevalent in this culture. So what king wouldn't think that this would be a good idea? But here's the kicker. You see, in the kingdom of the Medes and Persians, they had an idea, a concept, where if you wrote a law in a certain way, and you signed it in a certain way, that law could never be changed or revoked. And this is exactly how these supervisors encouraged Darius to write this law. Make sure you write it so it can't be changed or revoked. And that's exactly what Darius did. And this put Daniel in a very awkward position. It was his habit, his practice, to go to his house and to pray to his God three times a day. Three times a day he would go to an upstairs room where a window faced Jerusalem and he would open that window and he would kneel down and he would offer his prayers and his praises to God three times a day. And his these other supervisors knew about this. They knew that this was his practice. They knew how Daniel's faith had shown forth in all that he did. And they knew that this would put him in a bind. They knew that this would hit Daniel where it hurt. So what was Daniel going to do? What would you have done? Would it have been wrong for Daniel to simply close the window and pray so that no one could see him? I mean, he would still be praying, right? He would still be offering praises to God, and it would certainly have spared his life. But what impression would that have given to these other supervisors and leaders? Wouldn't it have seemed like Daniel was giving in that he was giving up his worship of his God, that he was obeying the king's orders instead of obeying God in his call to worship him. It would have seemed that Daniel had given up his faith, and Daniel wouldn't have that. So Daniel did exactly what we would expect him to do. What he and his companions had shown throughout their time in Babylon. He went home. He went to that upstairs bedroom where the window faced Jerusalem. He opened the window, got down on his knees, and he prayed and praised God, just 
as he had done before. And of course, the other supervisors went to see what Daniel would do, and they were overjoyed when they found him praying and praising God, and they immediately went to the king and reported what had happened. Again, played to the king's pride and prestige, and they said, Your Majesty, did you not sign a decree that anyone who prays to any god or person for 30 days except to you, Your Majesty, would be thrown into the den of lions? The king answered, Indeed I did. The order is established as a law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. And they responded to the king. Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, does not pay attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree that you signed. Instead, three times a day, he is praying his prayers. Gotcha. They had Daniel right where they wanted him. And there was seemingly no way out. When the king heard this report, he was very upset about it, but he was determined to save Daniel. So until sunset, he worked hard to rescue him. Then these men came as a group to the king and kept saying to the king, you know, your majesty, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that every decree or statute that the king establishes cannot be changed. Darius tried, but to no avail. There, there was no way that these supervisors were going to let this slide, or let there be any exceptions in this case. Darius seemingly had no choice but to follow through. His entire reputation and kingship depended on it. Then the king gave the order, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the pit. The king sealed it with his signet ring and the signet rings of his nobles, so that nothing could be changed with regard to Daniel's situation. The parallels between this account of Daniel and the lion's den the account of Jesus in his own tomb are striking. We can't help but think of the connection between the irrepealable laws of the Medes and the Persians and what Pilate said to the Pharisees and the chief priests. What I have written, I have written. The pit of lions was covered with a stone and sealed with the signet ring of the king and his nobles. And in the same way, Jesus' tomb was covered with a stone and made as secure as they knew how, including with a seal. Not to mention the experience of Daniel of being in that lion's den. It would have been completely dark. He would have had no idea where an attack would have come from. There was no hope of earthly rescue. Daniel's only hope was for the Lord to deliver him. We can't help but think of those three hours on the cross where the sun stopped shining, where darkness fell over the entire land, where there was no hope of rescue as Jesus Christ and his Father went unanswered. He was completely enduring the agony of hell right there on the cross. And isn't it interesting that we don't hear Daniel crying for deliverance, but Darius. It was Darius who called out to the Lord, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. In stark contrast, we hear Jesus saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So how did the story of Daniel play out? Then the king went to his palace, he spent the night without food, and no entertainment was brought before him. But he could not sleep. At dawn the king arose as soon as it was light and hurried to the lion's den. As he came near the pit, he cried out in a fearful voice. The king said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you served continually able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke with the king, may your majesty may you live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me because he found me innocent in his presence. Also before you, your majesty, I have committed no crime. The 
king was very glad and said that Daniel should be brought up from the pit. So Daniel was brought up from the pit. and He was unharmed because he trusted in his God. It was completely unfair for Daniel to be in this lion's den. He had done everything right. In a very certain sense, he could say that he was innocent. He had not committed a crime worthy of being in the lion's den. But in another sense, Daniel was not innocent. He was a sinner just like you and me. He confessed his sins in the same way that we do. Daniel was saved. He was found innocent in God's eyes only because of Jesus' faithfulness. Darius' prayer was answered with a resounding yes because of what Jesus accomplished for Daniel. Daniel was given the yes answer to Darius' prayer because Jesus' prayer is one unanswered for a time on the cross as he bared the sins of the world. Jesus put himself in imminent danger of death by his own choice. He willingly gave up his life for us. And even though they tried to keep him in the tomb, even though they tried to keep him dead, no flimsy seals of Pilate were going to keep Jesus from keeping his promises. And in the same way, no seals of the king or all of his nobles would be able to stop the Lord from protecting Daniel, even if God had allowed the lions to kill him. The basis for Daniel's rescue was Jesus' tomb, was Jesus' rescue. God could see Daniel innocent in his eyes because of what Jesus did on Good Friday, because of what Jesus accomplished on Easter Sunday. The same is true for us. We have no promise of God that we will not face unjust treatment because of our relationship with him. In fact, we know that just the opposite is true. Oftentimes, we will be persecuted and treated unjustly because of our relationship with Jesus. However, we do have the promise that no seal would keep, just as no seal would keep God's protection away from Daniel, there is nothing that will cover there's nothing that will seal God's promise to deliver us as well. There is nothing that will cover that in every way, because of Jesus' death, we are innocent in God's eyes. Jesus rising from the dead proves it. God has placed his seal on us. He's put his name on us in our baptisms. And in the same way that he continually cared for Daniel, God continually cares for us. We are innocent in God's presence because of what Jesus did on Good Friday. Because of what Jesus accomplished on Easter Sunday. And so it is with that same confidence that we humbly follow our Savior on the road to redemption. We're about to reach the home stretch. Our redemption is at hand. May God continue to bless us as we humbly follow and joyfully receive that gift of redemption. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses our understanding may keep you in your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. 